Originally, this was not part of the plan, but there was an insane amount of support for me to do some of the fringe dragons from previous editions. In 5th edition, we were made used to the basic metallic and chromatic types, but there are so, so many more. There are astral dragons, which are the ones that were born and evolved in the many different planar realities. There are gem dragons, which you might see some in the elemental planes of air, water, earth, and fire, alongside special biomes like the Underdark. And of course, there are many dragon variations that happen outside of Faerun, which is the continent that we're used to. Today, we're going to talk about steel dragons, so sit back, because things are about to get wild. A steel dragon has a slight build, a small head, and feline movement styles. Sword-like frills grow from its head, elbows, and digits. Its wings consist of overlapping blades that look like feathers, and the scales of the dragon's chest resemble shields. This is a steel dragon, and this is a silver dragon. When it comes to telling them apart, there are two big things. First, silver dragons have an enormous mohawk that's honestly kinda huge for telling any silver dragon apart from any other dragon, but the other thing is that a silver dragon will always look like it is chiseled out of a single piece of silver. Typically you can't really tell their scales apart because the dragon is incredibly smooth and shiny, it's glowing all the time. A steel dragon on the other hand will look like it is made out of a thousand tiny blades. You will also notice a lot of runes carved into its metal, and we'll talk about why that is later on, but those will be the two biggest differentiating factors between these two types of dragons. Keep that in mind, it's important. See, both silver dragons and steel dragons hang out in humanoid society. They both share relatively similar treasure cravings, they both prefer humans over other humanoids like elves and dwarves, and they both prefer humanoid food over traditional dragon hunting. Also, both prefer to lair in nice environments like man mansions rather than stinky lairs like caves and dungeons. These, these creatures are extremely similar in mannerism, so telling them apart is actually quite crucial. Now, more importantly though, both of these types of dragons enjoy polymorphing into humans in order to live among them. So if they share all of these very similar factors and behavioral patterns, what's the actual difference between them? Well, the actual difference is that silver dragons like to pretend to be humans. Steel dragons literally become humans. This would be the point of the video where I would talk about what we know about the creature based on what we're told in the 5th edition lore books, just so that then I can continue the video with everything that they did not talk about, which is usually the coolest stuff. But this time around, we're actually doing something quite special. Steel dragons have not yet made an appearance in 5th edition, which means that this entire video is technically stuff that they haven't told you about. It is probably just a matter of time until they release a steel dragon in some upcoming book, so you're actually getting this advanced treat, so enjoy this. Now, with that out of the way, Let's get this started. The first and main thing that you need to know about steel dragons is that they don't live their lives as steel dragons. Similarly to silver dragons, steel dragons polymorph into humanoids in order to live among them, but when they do, they go full immersion. First of all, the steel dragon will never disclose that it is a dragon and it will never get itself out of its polymorph. Second, the steel dragon will not have multiple guises. It will generally pick one and it will stick with that one for decades and decades. Third, the dragon will actually live the life of its guise. The transformation is not to, to reach some kind of goal or to manipulate a person. The steel dragon does not transform in order to fulfill some personal agenda. The dragon will transform into a person and live the life of the person simply for the purpose of living the life of that person. The steel dragon will be fully immersed in the life that it chooses. That's what it likes to do. And there is actually no life that the dragon will not want to live, which is inherently based on the neutrality of the creature. And still dragons have the neutral alignment, which means that they are completely unbiased with the personalities and morals that they choose to have. One life, the steel dragon could be a hero, 
the next a murderer and a thief. But what actually makes a dragon so incredibly interesting is actually the, the level of immersion that they go through when they decide which kind of life to live. See, before the dragon is about to go into its next life, it will go through a ritual called a vaulting. Here, let me give you a quote from an actual steel dragon called Sembrim. We steels live many lives, but we live one at a time and cannot carry the others around like dead scales. Thus, we perform a meditation of sorts after each life, and we call this the vaulting, when our memories are stored away but not obliterated. In the next life, we will not be bothered by the memory of the one previous. It's better that way. Vaulting allows the steel dragon to sort of forget about its past life, so that its memories will not conflict with the immersion of the next one. This allows the steel dragon to maintain his objectivity and remove any prejudices that he might have gotten in the past. To him, the memories would feel like a hazy, distant thing, like cloudy deja vus of other lives or, or memories of old friends from long ago. Dragons typically have close to perfect memories and generally can recall things extraordinarily well, but after a steel dragon vaults, it might feel like to them what to us are our memories when we are children, just this very distant and very hasty recollection of events. Vaulting does not remove the dragon's self-awareness, neither does it eliminate its magical knowledge or wisdom. It will still know it is a dragon in thought and soul. It knows itself. It is, however, crucial for the steel dragon to do this after every life, since a steel dragon loves as much as anyone else, human or otherwise. Since the steel dragon is bound to eventually leave a life to start a new one, it will always be leaving people it cares about behind. Humanoid wives or husbands, children it may have fathered, close friends and any parental figures it might have gotten. Vaulting allows the dragon to completely forget about these individuals so that it may seek to start a new life unrestricted and unhinged. What's incredible about the steel dragons is that they have probably the best polymorph for this form of venture. See, the ability for a steel dragon to turn into a humanoid is particularly great because it possesses a very special ability called time touching. The magic of time touching allows a steel dragon's polymorphed guys to actually age like a normal person would age. This aging process is natural and fluid, and it does not require the input of the dragon at all. The human body of the dragon ages even while it is sleeping. And normally, a dragon would have to magically shift its polymorph to create strands of white hair, or to show the signs of aging. But the steel dragon does not have to do anything of the sort. It all just happens subconsciously. On top of this, the steel dragon gains access to a special power of his called Guy's Empowerment. This ability can only be used on the guys that it uses for the life it has chosen, but after about a month's work attuning itself to its new body, the steel dragon could gain the benefits of its normal draconic body, even while still polymorphed as a human or humanoid. This means that even though the dragon would look like a humanoid, it could punch with the strength of a dragon. It could carry things with the vigor of a dragon, and its skin would be as tough as that of a dragon, even though the body would still look perfectly human. We're not even done here, by the way, but, but both of these powers are designed just so that the dragon can maintain full immersion. Since the dragon doesn't have to use its magics to change its body to suit its aging process, it can more easily blend in and become its role. And with the help of Guy's empowerment, the dragon does not even have to leave its humanoid form in order to survive assassination attempts or fatal accidents. There are two more things about the Steel Dragon's incredible polymorph ability though, and these ones are actually pretty crazy. See, the Steel Dragon is, in, in a lot of ways, a divine servant of Io, the god of gods and the leader of the Draconic Pantheon. We'll touch more on what the role is in the grand scheme of things, but just for now know that Io has essentially blessed them with these great abilities just so that they can do their job. But yeah, I just wanted to drop that in there just so that you would know and it would make sense why the dragon is so powerful before I tell you what I'm about to tell you. The steel dragon's polymorph actually allows the dragon to bypass most basic divination spells meant for discovering dragons. 
The transformation into a humanoid, it, it's so strong or so good that it protects the dragon from things that are meant to discover dragons. These include spells that would read the mind of the dragon in order to find out whether the creature is a dragon or not. It's incredible. But it gets even crazier than that. Technically speaking, the steel dragon has the ability to somewhat shut off its draconic side altogether during its immersion, allowing it to father normal children instead of fathering half dragons. Let me just repeat that here real quick. The steel dragon, whilst polymorphed into a human, can impregnate another human or be impregnated itself by a human and obtain a baby that is 100% human instead of half human, half dragon. These babies might still develop draconic ancestry sorcery later on in their lives, but they're not gonna look like dragons at all, which is incredible. No other dragon can do this. This, of course, allows the steel dragon to have a family without being ousted as a magical monster, which once again helps in their immersion of living the life of a humanoid. Now, why would Io, the god of gods, blessed steel dragons with these powers? I'll talk about that later on, but first, these abilities are there for the dragon to be able to continue its existence, but it also possesses abilities that allows it to achieve lives that would otherwise be unreachable. What if the dragon would choose to live as a king? Or what if the dragon chooses to live as a bandit lord? With any of these two choices, the dragon would need followers, people to look up to it, to do what he commands. Let's see, the last power that the steel dragon was blessed with is the ability to morph and shift its sphere aura. See, all dragons have a frightening presence. It is a magical ability that they all have for them to instill fear on those around them. It is a magical ability. Uh, steel dragons have different uses, actually, for this special aura, and they can change its effect into other types, or more specifically, into three other types. One. Manifestation. The dragon can produce a presence that allows it to imbue those around it with the feeling that the dragon must be heeded or listened to or admired. The dragon uses this in political battles as a noble, in taverns to gather attention as an adventurer, or in universities as a scholar. The second one is Obscurement. They can make it so that those around them have a hard time focusing on the dragon, which would allow it to escape notice or attention. The dragon would use this while masquerading as a thief or in war. And lastly, three, emotion control. Using this presence, the steel dragon can incite great passion in those he is among. With this, the dragon can stand in human guise before a crowd of people, and by the force of his words, he can incite them to riot or to prevent one. Using these abilities and the powerful polymorph at his disposal, the steel dragon would spend literally hundreds, if not thousands of years living all kinds of lives. From peasants and farmers to heroes and kings, from businessmen to pirates, and from maids to adventurers. The steel dragon will spend its entire existence shifting and moving from life to life, experiencing every single facet of the humanoid existence. They call this process the chain of lives, and it is sacred to the steel dragon for it is literally what it will do for its entire lifespan. Once again, the dragon never lives its life as an actual steel dragon. It just does this all the time. Now you might be asking, what is the purpose of this? Why would you go from one life to another if you're not gonna even remember any of this? Steel dragons go through the vaulting ritual at the end of every life just to start a new fresh life again, which of course makes them forget everything about their past life. So what is the purpose? of this cycle. See, before the dragon vaults at the end of each life, it will create a piece of art. This art contains the experience and knowledge gained by the dragon during this past life. If the dragon lived as a teacher, it might write a book about the new discoveries it did as a scholar. If the dragon lived as an adventurer, it, it might create magical weapons or high-level spell scrolls. If it was a musician, then it might create and write a great symphony. 
After each life, the dragon will create a wonderful piece of art that will signify the life it lived, and most importantly, it'll be a piece of art that will show the wisdom the dragon collected during its time in that life. It does this to save its discoveries and its knowledge for prosperity, since vaulting will force a dragon to forget everything that it has actually learned. The dragon will then hide this piece of art in a special lair hidden from the world. Throughout the years, as the dragon continues the chain of lives and create multiple pieces of art, its lair will grow and its creations will expand further and further until it is a proper horde. This, the steel dragons call their composition. And this will be their legacy. By the end of their lives, this will comprise the totality of the wisdom the dragon gained during its lifespan. It is believed that this was the reason Ayo created the steel dragons, so that the god could use these works of art in order to teach other dragons about the world and about living life. When the steel dragon has completed its last life and it is ready to die, it will enter into a form of lucid dreaming or hibernation called the reflection. During the reflection, the dragon will lie in slumber, vividly recalling every single moment of every single life the dragon has lived, essentially eliminating every vault that the dragon has completed. This will allow the dragon to remember everything about their life in perfect clarity and detail. The process can take centuries to complete, during all of which the dragon will be unconscious for. At the end of the reflection, the steel dragon will die. It is believed by steel dragons alive today that at the end of the reflection, Io himself comes and takes the dragon with him to heaven, where the dragon will be tested for his wisdom. All the knowledge that the dragon has accumulated during all of its many lives will come into play in this test, and if the dragon passes, then the dragon will become part of Io's divine essence. But if the dragon fails, then it will be reincarnated into a new steel dragon for it to live a new existence and try again. Okay, whew, now let's talk about what happens in between the chain of lives. Normally there is only about a 1-2 to two year interim between lives for a steel dragon, where they actually go out as a physical dragon in order to socialize with other steel dragons and talk about the life that they just lived. This is when the dragon would actually try and find someone to actually mate with as a dragon in order to create real dragon babies. When the dragon finds someone, then both steel dragons will actually go into the next life together as a married couple, though this life will not last as long. The two steel dragons generally will find an isolated location like a farm and live there together. They will shift in and out of human and draconic form in order to actually mate and take care of the eggs, the eggs which they will keep in their human home. When the eggs hatch, the parents will continue to shift in and out of draconic form in order in order to teach the baby about the duality of their existence and to get them accustomed to life as a human. As the baby grows older, the parents will start to introduce it to human society through other farms, towns and cities and gradually get them to start socializing with humanoids in general. But after all of the teachings are done, then it will be the time for the final lesson. Vaulting. Vaulting is the last thing that they will teach the young dragon, for after the baby's first vault is completed, it will actually forget about its parents. It will remember all of its teachings and lessons, but the parents will be completely forgotten, and the baby will never see its mother or father ever again. The parents will also proceed to vault themselves before starting their new life, so they will forget about each other as well as their baby. This whole mating process will generally not take longer than 10 years. During each of their lives, the steel dragon might link itself with random people. Some of these people might be friends of the dragon and others might not even know that the dragon has done this to them. But what happens is when the dragon comes out of a life, it'll find itself confused about the events of the world at large. Uh, remember, the dragon basically forgets everything about its past at the beginning of each of its lives. So to be able to properly choose which life the dragon will live next, it has to know about what's going on in the world. In essence, it needs spies to tell it what's going on. The dragon will grab random people in the world from different locations and different ways of life and will connect itself to them. Still dragons call this ability Agelink. 
after a dragon is finished with one of its lives and it is vaulting, it'll receive through dreams memories of these people it is age linked with. These memories will give the dragon all the insight it needs about the world to figure out where to go next. The dragon will have a magical rune in its body for every single person it has linked with. The dragon, however, generally does not remember who these people are that he has linked with in this fashion, as the dragon will always forget everything about his previous life as it vaults. This magical spell that the steel dragons have to age link with people is actually a magical secret only known to steel dragons. Steel dragons will go through their many lives not remembering many of their wives and husbands, family members, sons, daughters, friends. At the beginning of each life, they will forget everything about their previous life. They will forget all except for their soul bond. When the dragon finds a true friend, the truest of all, a friend or a companion that the dragon wants to keep throughout all of its lives, it will name that person its soul bond. This will be the only person in the world who will know of the steel dragon's true identity, and it will be, for all intents and purposes, the dragon's truest bonded friend. The dragon can only pick one person to soul bond in its life, and this person generally will be from a long-lived race, like an elf or a dwarf, a person that can actually live through multiples of the dragon's human lives. This individual will help the dragon assimilate into new lives. It will assure the dragon that regardless of whatever life it has chosen, it will have someone to be with, and someone to watch his back. The dragon, in exchange, will grant the soul bond protection, companionship, and an array of magical powers. The soul bond will obtain some abilities to shapeshift, albeit basic. The soul bond will get the ability to change his face and features of its body to that of others. For example, he will be able to change the color and length of its hair, the features of its face, and so on, as long as the changes are not too great. The soul bond will not be able to, for example, change race. It's only a minor shapeshifting ability. So both the dragon and the soul bond will be able to telepathically speak with each other from anywhere in the world. The biggest reason to soul bond with a person, however, is because the steel dragon would need a true friend to perform a last favor for the dragon before the dragon goes and enters its reflection at the end of its life. When the dragon has completed all of its lives and it is ready to die, the dragon will need a person to spread its composition all across the world. See, the point of creating all the wonderful works of art at the end of each life, the whole point of the great composition, is so that it can then be spread across the world to any who would need it. The dragon wants its wisdom spread all across the globe. It wants its life to have meaning. It wants its knowledge to have usefulness. It wants everything that it went through to mean something. And as such, the dragon will ask of its soul bond to spread its composition all across the world, while the dragon will become ready to die. The soul bond will be able to do with the composition as it wishes, and would be allowed to spread it in whatever way it would want. The only thing that the dragon would ever ask is that it would be spread without bias. Remember, the dragon is a neutral creature. The soul bond could sell it on the street, could drop it in front of a library, could auction it, could donate it to a museum, it could give it as heirlooms to different parts of his family. The way of its spread is not important to the dragon, only that it is spread around and, and that people get to see it and hopefully learn from it. Steel dragons are extraordinarily rare, because allegedly they didn't actually form and evolve here in Faerun, or not even on this planet of Toro. The talk amongst legendary sages is that they might have come from Greyhawk, a different world, and somehow found themselves here through portals and astral traveling. There are known to be at least three steel dragons in Waterdeep, one in Neverwinter, another one in Vasa, and lastly one in Akinul, though these are just the ones that we know. There is, however, a consortium of half-steel dragons called the Confluence in Waterdeep, who apparently organized in order to hunt evil doppelgangers in the city. Interesting stuff. 
I would like to thank my patron supporters, Rukato Fan, Major Fail Gaming, Wyatt Curlin, Barry, Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Thraxeris, Toby Oliver, Dylan Baker, Zach Bowell, Spencer, Boech, and Miri Ogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to watch the playlist for all of my Dungeons and Dragons videos. Uh, they have been an incredible blast to make and you guys have been loving them so far. So if you haven't seen them all, make sure to click on that playlist and go through them. I guarantee you, you're going to have a grand old time. Let me know if you guys enjoyed the Steel Dragon. Leave those comments down there. Give me a like if you did, a dislike if you didn't. And follow me on Twitter, por favor on the description. Thank you so much once again, and I'll see you all on the next video. Bye-bye.